Hi, my name is Benedict. This is part three, count them all, one, two, three, of the Simple Songwriting series. The first part, we looked at creating the very basics of what we need, which became our verse. Part two, we look to extrapolate our verse into choruses and a full arrangement. So let's take a moment to dip through what we have got. Some of you may be thinking, Benedict, you said it was going to be simple and it's not. No, of course it's not. There is a lot to it, but I have kept it simple and extrapolated a bit to give us a full arrangement so that it seems like it's a lot less simple than it really is. Simple means that we start with this chord progression. Tempting to say, oh, we're not going to do that because we're too cool. But give yourself a sense of where you're going, because by remember, remember by creating these extra notes, let's drag them into the end of view here, by creating these notes that are on top of, we might say that that was our bass line, and just have only built the bass line, but by putting these notes on top, we've given ourselves so much more texture, plus all the other notes that you'll hear through this, all the other sounds, everything else you hear through this is essentially those very same notes that we'd already put together. We just rearranged them, used them a little differently. And that has given us this great wealth of material. Even this lead that we first meet in the chorus, remember, nothing but, with the exception of one little point, nothing but chord notes. They're notes that we wrote. All we had to do was repurpose them. So that makes it so much easier than going, where am I going to get this line from? Where's this musical bit going to come from? You know, out of the ether? No, it's going to come from the chord notes you've already got. You made it easy for yourself. Yes, there is a fair amount of work if you want a slightly more complex arrangement, but there's not a lot. So we got all these parts. But it's not yet a song because we don't have anyone singing. As I said to you yesterday, I haven't written a lyric in properly in 20 or so years, and nor do I feel the desire to. I sort of think about it for a few moments, or sometimes people say, oh, you used to do these songs, and it's just, it's not there. Uh, maybe if I were forced to at gunpoint, I might do it, but I just don't feel like it's there. So we're going to use the very next best thing, which is samples. So we go to our verse and we're going to add some vocals. This is what's called a vocal melody. Now, often when I try to talk to people who say, I've written a song and I need some music, I will tend to say to them, okay, have you got your chords and your vocal melody? Because if they haven't got chords and a vocal melody, it's not a song. They've just written some words which they're hoping to sing. The song must have chords and a vocal melody or it's not a song. It can be turned into a song, but it means that somebody's got to create those chords and vocal melody. As I've said to you already, just singing the same... No, 
episode over and over is essentially suicide. I know that it's very popular, but a thing that's very popular is always the past, as in that's what people have done before. If you're looking to attach, to attract new attention, doing exactly what Trailer Swift just did over the last three, five years is probably a really bad plan because she's probably doing something different in the studio right now which will come out before you finish yours and come out with a multi-million dollar marketing campaign. So whilst you're still doing, she's doing, who looks silly now. And she's got a multi-million dollar marketing campaign to convince people that this is so much the best thing ever done. Think strategically, you must. You need to appeal to people who are really over this and looking for something different and who are preferably not stupid enough to fall for this and therefore give them something of value that's going to last, which means create a vocal melody, a real one. So let's look at our vocal melody. Our vocal melody is related to, oh, sorry, going the wrong way. The old eyes just don't work very well at the moment. So if we go to our chords, here's, here's our vocal melody up here, and there are chords down below. We don't need to worry about that. If we were to take these, because these are in a different octave, if we were to drop them down, we would see how they're not really the same but they stay fairly close to our chords. But because they're in a different octave, then where you might have that appearing to happen, this works so much easier. So we're starting with our root note. Now remember, I've got all this transposed. I'm writing a C here but it's actually playing a D on the synth because I'm working my way sneakily around how to work in a different key or scale. Not as good as doing the real thing, but remember I said we want to make this simple. So that gives you access to just by transposing and locking to another scale. So that's our root note. Always important to start with your root note because the first note that you have people hear, at least the first major note that you have people hear, will tend to say to them, this is the root note of our song. And you might go, why do I care? Because when I listen to Guns N' Roses, I don't go, oh, look, that's in E major. No, you don't. And But at the same time, your body, your brain will take that center and know therefore how the rest of the melody is going to work. It's not cheating, it's not being boring, it's not limiting you. Taking random... Try singing that. What's coming next? You know. That's why these one and two note melodies are so overused because people they're trying to create something that's singable with no effort. But any song that you remember, a good song that you remember, preferably something 20, 30 years ago where they actually had melodies, you can flow and track all the way through it. You may not be singing in tune, but as far as you're aware, you're tracking that melody right. And so giving people the root note at the beginning helps them know... Where it's going to go. So root note, we need to have some movement. We do keep coming back to similar spots. So our melody really moves that's really our melody if we boiled it right back but it's the passing notes that make things interesting. So if you listen to the level of interest between and suddenly 
so much more interesting. Again, this is not about whether you think that's your genre. This is a singer I've got access to. I think she's rather cool. I've used her a few times actually in things. But it's the amount of interest that she's brought to this material. So together... Very singable. If I had words, no doubt they could fit in there. If you have your words first, which you really should do before you're writing a song, then obviously you would make sure that these match. You'd have some sort of sense of how you're singing it against your chords, and then you'd work out how to put it down. Now, if you're not sure where those notes should go, remember, start with your root note. Our root note here is a C. So you're going to start on that root note. You're hearing a D. That's where you would start singing. There's no point starting singing in a different note. Yes, there are reasons and situations in which you will. But remember, this is about keeping it simple. So you want to start in the right place, which is your root note. So you say, OK, uh, where am I going to go next? If it's an I love you baby, uh, uh, I love you baby, I love you baby. Don't worry, I can't sing in tune. I'm not worried about that and that's not the point. Even you don't need to be able to sing super well in tune. You'll know that when I'm following this, I can actually do a far better job because it's that sense of flow. Music comes out of us naturally. So build your vocal melody. I focused more on the top notes, but rather than using the B here as my first note, because it's not my C, I've moved it to the C. Remember, our chord is that, which is a C chord is rooted here. Therefore, there's no problem with using that because it's still this. If we put it in the same octave, it actually still works, but it's a, you know, it's a t tiny bit tight, a little bit. So moving to another octave, the fact that we've got C on the bottom, C on the top, those ones in the middle, they just become colour. That is now our vocal melody. Hear how the piece has suddenly become so much more interesting. If they were words, it would in many ways be more interesting again because so long as those words are not gibberish and far too many songs are gibberish you know just cliched lines you know i would trade all my colors to to get rid of your blue so is something like a line i heard out of a song in a movie last night and i'm just sort of thinking oh god that's not a song lyric that is just an embarrassment um doggerel This will create the interest against your backing. Remember, your backing is not the lead. If that was the lead, then you wouldn't be here. You're writing a song, so it's supposed to back. Like the bed that you lie on. When you're lying on the bed, you should hopefully be the interesting thing. The bed is merely stopping you from lying on the pointy rocks. Now that we've got that vocal melody, I showed you this briefly yesterday, but we can go back to our intro. I said yesterday don't waste your time with long intros we could say okay we won't have any vocal here for and there's nothing wrong with that at all nothing wrong with that at all but by the time I've got even to here that's 15 seconds that I've asked people to listen to 
whatever. If I go through the whole 16 bars, that's 32 seconds that I've asked them to not really get engaged with my song. And you might be like, oh, but that's all the important stuff. No, it's not. Let people get into that vocal as quickly as you can. If you really need a little intro, one or two bars would probably be enough. That's called showing your wares. So that's where you might just use one bar or two bars of this. So we might go, okay, let's turn that off. And that's it, then we'd be into the song. We probably wouldn't even have worried with the, uh, the melodic part. But let's throw people straight into the song. But you see how I've started here, we'll turn our vocal off. We've got our vocal melody playing in one of the instruments. That not only helps the singer get it right, gets them oriented in the first place, but we've got an instrument and the voice tracking the same thing, making it really clear what our theme is. We want to get people into our theme. Just like with Star Wars, we've got this strong theme right from the beginning, and it's very clearly stated. It's not hidden. The um, Star Trek Discovery, Star Trek's theme was normally quite clear and open. Not quite as good as Star Wars, but very clear and very open theme. The um, Discovery, it basically makes you wait the whole way through the intro before it even gets to the theme. It's interesting. It's horribly modern. And I kind of like it. But at the same time, if we weren't dying to watch that show already, the fact that it refuses to get to the theme kind of says, hmm, maybe this whole show is going to be refusing to get to the point. Which, perfectly honestly, I kind of felt a bit that way. Not as nasty as Picard, but I kind of felt that way. So. Make it really nice and clear to your listener. What is my theme? What are we doing here? I then move as we move into the second part. I've moved the vocal melody to the clearer of the two instruments. So I started with the more muted instrument, moved it to the clearer of the two instruments because it's actually really established by that point. You might think, oh, well, I'll start with the more with the clearer of the instruments. In this case, it just felt forced. I wanted it to feel subtle because the focus still needs going to, going to need to be on that lead vocal because it's the lead vocal that it's about. It's the song that it's about. And then introduced the other element, which is our rhythm section. This repeats, and repetition is good. Repetition is good. Repetition is good. What is repetition? Good. So we want that repetition here, as from first verse to second verse, we don't need to do anything different. If we listen to Europe's The Final Countdown, what happens when you get to the end of that? Repetition. Just don't do it ad nauseum. We have some difference here because our musical backing has changed a little bit. We're also introducing a second vocal. endless supply of singing ladies, I got another one to come along and double our vocal part. 
I know you may be an only person with no friends like me and feel like you're going to need to sing that vocal part yourself again, and I encourage you to do this. But here's a trick. When you sing that vocal part a second time, if you're wanting to create variety, pretend that you're Ukrainian, or if you're Ukrainian, then pretend that you're French. If you're French, well, <laughs> no, then you can pretend that you're Russian or American or whatever. We're looking to pull out something different from your voice. Because when I speak in a different accent, then my voice sounds different. And that gives a rather different kind of feel on, on the recording than my normal voice. See, So look for variety. You don't necessarily want to be singing like Donald Duck, but just look for something different in your voice. So then we've got some contrast because you can't build a choir with one voice. Doesn't matter how many times you sing the same thing, it just becomes you harmonizing with yourself. You can do it as a straight if you're going to back yourself at this point, but also consider singing it a little differently. So that lifts this. We've now got into the full material. We're, we're teasing and experimenting with the material in the first part. We've got it all together. We've got our second lady singing, and we come to our chords. Let's turn off our second singer for the moment. First singer. probably notice that this is what I had as my string line. They are one and the same, just moved apart by an octave, because not many people are going to sing down here. So yes, it is a fair range, but it's an octave. It sounds very operatic because my favourite singer happens to be a soprano, but the reality is an octave is not very big. We've already covered an octave. It just sounds awfully dramatic because of the way it's put together. And the lesson from this is that we don't actually need to have a lot of range to sound dramatic. We've just got to be dramatic and we've got to use what we've got quite well. We could have started here and then just moved these notes around and basically been... Aww. been fine but I already had this line and if you can't manage an octave that's okay then just look to move these lower notes up here so you're starting and ending here rather than an octave is a fair move but we've got 16 bars to move over it and it was nice and dramatic and I wanted to make the most of the nice and dramatic singer I had always make the most of what you've got so We've got distinguishable. Melody lines between verse and chorus. If you just carry the same melody into your chorus. Not only is it lazy, but we haven't added anything extra to make people interested. We've still got our vocal second here. Notice very much how as we come into that chorus, it says this is new. This is a new section. It's not saying this is a new random song. It's just saying this is a new section. We've got a clear finish and then we start with something new, which is this build. To help with that, I added another singer.
it's male and it's lower. We want to add a little bit more body in. Because we've got these quite bright, high singers, where possible, we want to add in some body. I know it's super fashionable to sing, hey, I like this all the time. <laughs> but the problem is it doesn't feel grounded. And one of the reasons we like the, the classic radio jock voice is because it feels very grounded. We feel confident and secure in that. So if you've got a singer that sings like this all the time, then we don't feel very grounded with them. Settle into your chest as you sing. And where you're looking to create a sense of more power, if you're a female singer, definitely add in a male vocalist. Or if you can, drop yourself an octave. If you're singing up here, sing down here. And while that doesn't have to be the lead, as that's mixed in with the upper vocal, the two will come together and sound a lot stronger. So entry. In. Help say, oh, this is a central piece. We've now got more backing. There are more people agreeing with me on what I'm singing here. They're singing exactly the same lines. Exactly the same lines. So if you're singing your own words, I love you, baby, then, as I say, you can use different accents, different parts of your vocal range. You don't have to be super strong in backing. You can simply build up a lot more texture. It's more passes, it's a bit more time, but the records that you like, they probably put more time in than you think. So that's our verse and chorus done. Now it's mostly repetition. So we get to the end of our first chorus. Right back to here. Our backing is a little different, but we're going to the familiar. Remember repetition? Yes, repetition. We remember that because it's been repeated so that we remember it. It's comfortable because this took us somewhere else. The chorus took us somewhere else. And now we like to go back to somewhere we're comfortable. And we know how we know we're comfortable? Because if we've liked this enough to get to one and a half minutes, then we liked what we heard before. If we didn't like this, lots of people would be gone by now. So if we've gotten to here, we're actually kind of liking it. If we've got to here, we're starting to key into it because we've had it twice. Here, we're, and we haven't turned off, we're probably going, oh, this is quite cool. We've got the familiar where it's like, oh, I know this. I like this. There's proof that I like this because I've listened to it twice already. Now I'm exciting to be here. I'm excited to be hearing it a third time. Get to the end of our third verse back into the chorus. We're again excited to hear that chorus even though it's kind of exactly the same because we like the same. But because we liked it so much here that we stayed for it again. Once we establish it's the chorus we know we're going to hear it again. We want to hear it again. Great, we're going to give people exactly that, exactly the same chorus they had before, except remember this time to add a little bit more variety, we kept the French horn in and gave it a slight variation. A couple of little moments of harmony. done something different here, but not as different as you think. 
this comes in differently. It's very dramatically. We are two-thirds of the way through the song. And this is the point that normally Slash steps up on top of the piano and starts playing his guitar. Watch November Rain. This has to be the high point of the song. It has to work its way. Go up, down, up, down, and then up, up, up. So the chorus is taking us up. And then around here, we need to have that lift off moment. And that is commonly where you get your screaming guitar solo. We haven't got a guitarist. And nor are we repurposing any of these instruments to make complex solos. It can be done, and if you can do it, go for it. But you don't need to worry about that because you've got a singer, and your singer does not have to be singing like this. In some ways, having used this soprano is a little bit of a, a liability, you might think, but I can't sing like that, therefore it's like, yeah, get over yourself. If you've got an interesting song, this last verse should be a turnaround. And if you do it a little differently, it'll grab people's attention. So what we've got is rather than our vocal rising at the beginning, it's actually starting high. Now it's it started here. Uh, not there. And climbed. We could have started here. Or something. But seeing I know my singer can go up here, might as well use her. How dramatic is that? But in reality, none of that's much different from what we had before. So we've taken exactly the same pattern, just moved some of the notes to different places. Do this because it's unexpected and yet still expected. And it provides this wonderful like, wow, that got my attention. And it's the that got my attention that will make people want to come back and listen to it again. So this is the high point of the song, literally. So the men are doing exactly the same, but the vocal second, the, the um, lead singer's second, is dropped out at this point. She's been here. And he's here. But we don't want to overload this. If we have our vocal second in here as well, it's not really adding anything. But when we bring it back in, it adds more because it wasn't there just before. So don't be afraid to drop things. I see a lot of times where people make an arrangement and they go, oh, well, I've put four things in, so I have to keep all my four things all the way through. Or keep adding more until you've got, you know, start with two and you've got 28 at the end. It's like, no, switch things in and out. And that way you, you get the value of having them come back in again. So that's my one, two, fourth verse which is your final verse. It's normally your turnaround where we discover that, you know, there's probably a good reason that she left you or you discover that by her leaving you, you met somebody better looking. Any of those things, you should turn around. This is where you, you get something else out and it provides the real resolution to the song. <laughs> then makes it just a pure joy to go around that chorus again. But the second version of the chorus has to add something because we're repeating it, it's got to add something in some way.
It's not super obvious, but what happens is that this takes over from this. So if we solo just these two, So we've just added another line to give ourselves more variety. That variant is just the variant that we made with our French horns. So I haven't written a single extra note. I've just used what I already had. See, simple because you can make the most of what you've already got rather than having to constantly write new things. You just go, okay, I could use another line in here. And so you use what you've already got. Repurpose that material. This also saves us from going right down to the bottom. So that the second version of the chorus comes in still without going to the bottom and having to climb again, it comes in at a higher level. So the first chorus raises us, the second one drops a little bit, but rather than going back to where we started, it's gone back to here, which means that we'll feel like we've gone even higher, which we do. Because it rises and we've got extra string and that extra vocal line, which really rises up. That is it. I have now finished a song. Yeah, it doesn't have unique words, but it's got vocal melodies, it's got vocal backings, it's got all the parts that we need to have a great song. Now, I want to step aside for a moment. Well, not really aside, but I just want to step aside and say, if you came into this, or you came into your own session, thinking, I'm only going to have a good song because if it's this particular genre, you're going to set yourself up for fail. Because what if what the song gods are giving you is a little different? I mean, God, I'm using the example of November Rain. What the hell is that song? It's a stunning piece of work that stretches over quite a lot of sections and bits and pieces. Is it a folk song? Is it a metal song? Is it, a, uh, is it like a Richard Marx ballad? What the hell is that song? Who cares? It's a great piece of work. Broadly, we just call it rock because it's what rock really can be when it pulls its finger out of its backside. Brilliant work. Let your things be what they want to be. Now, I came into this, as I said last time, thinking that because I've been writing some stuff that's kind of, you know, elements of rockabilly, rock and roll, so like um, the shadows, um, you know, the... the, the melody driven instrumental stuff that they did and shades of early goth like really early goth rock um i just assumed okay well i will make something and show something like that but at the same time i also didn't want to focus on making the right sounds before i did anything i just wanted to move quickly because the focus had to be on the notes Rather than grabbing anything complex, because that then gives the impression that you can only do this when you've got the right sounds, I just grabbed, and you'll see that it's largely used a couple of preset modules, the ID8 being a little device that's got preset piano and what have you. And when it came to the guitars, obviously they sound different from what I have been using because I've been making my own sounds. But it's like, no, no, I'm not going to fight with that. I'm going to go with what is there. And this is really important because if I'd fall with it, I would have had struggles and probably decided, ah, this is too hard and given up. I really very much hope that you see all the way through this. I've been trying to guide you away from the things that are likely to cause you to feel stressed and like you're failing and therefore giving up because that's, that's a bad outcome. Now, by the time I started putting the vocal stuff into this with my uh, favorite soprano and her friends, I started to think, 
This is miles away from where I thought I was going to be. Now, I could have either been all boo-hoo about it, I suck, I need to go and kill myself, and then write a song about killing myself, and then kill myself again because I can't finish my song about killing myself because I suck so much. Which is really a stupid strategy, a really stupid strategy. I know part of the brain gets excited and gets off on that, the whole self-misery routine. Um, but the reality is I set out to make a song and finish it. So rather than going, oh, the fact that this sounds completely different, it's like, okay, great, let's use that. My soprano behaves quite differently from what I would have expected, especially if I were to sing it myself with my two semitone octave um, vocal range. I said, okay, let's work with it. And by the time I'd brought in the extra parts, I thought, you know, this sounds more like Demis Roussos than anything I've ever done before. Now, I don't have a problem with that because not so long ago, I got a best of Demis Roussos. You know what? I really like it. I actually started to uh, to play with the idea of um, of doing a cover, you know, download the MIDI and, and, you know, put synth sounds on it and what have you. But you know what? I've ended up writing my own song that's kind of vaguely reminiscent of Demis Roussos. As far as I'm concerned, that's a brilliant thing. If I set out to write metal and I ended up with Demis Roussos, how is that a bad thing? Because I didn't set out to write metal. I just set out to write a song. And guess what? I have a song. This is good. I've allowed the song to let itself lead and go where it needs to go and not to fight with anything that I have gotten. Because the moment I start fighting with what I've got is the moment I start to fail. And the moment I start to fail, that part of my brain that loves failure, that loves to be, oh, boo-hoo, oh, no, I'm the most pathetic person ever, oh, look at my excessive patheticness, there's no one more pathetic than me, will really get into gear, and that will stop me. So I know not to let that one get in the way. I've learnt that the hard way, really have. That's why I can tell you what happens, because I've been there. So... Come in with a really open mind. Come in to deliver your song. Your song is not a genre. If you just want to do genre stuff, go grab loops and say, ooh, look, I'm genreing. That's not music. Keep it away from me. If you've got a song you want to deliver, deliver your song. The way that it comes out is the way that it comes out, and that's how you will find unique. Demis Roussos stood out because there was nobody making records that sounded like Demis Roussos's. I don't have any other records that sound like that. And that's brilliant. Over time, people may have gotten a tiny bit tired of the Demis Roussos sound, but you know what? I still enjoy listening to my Demis Roussos record, and I still will. I won't listen to it necessarily every day, but where I'm looking for the feel that only that record can give me, guess what? Demis! So be really open-minded as to what comes. If your sounds are like this, this is what you work with. This is the result you get. And that will become your style. There are lots of genres and styles and movements that have come out of this kind of, I didn't hit the target I thought I was going to hit, but you know what, I've got this. And that's what gives us true movements and truly unique material, whether that is rockabilly, rock. I mean, the Beatles didn't really know what they were doing. They were making it up as they went along, and that defined a lot of what came after in terms of rock, because other people were going... Wah! and wanted to, to work with some of that themselves. And that gave us uh, Moody Blues, um, The Nice, which gave us Emerson, Lake and Palmer, Lake and, Palmer um, and Yes, and all these other amazing acts, Asia, um, uh, King Crimson, Eno, Roxy, Bowie, all of these things came out of that of people going, oh, okay, that's not what I expected, but you know what, that's rather cool, and went with it. So the things that come up, go with them. That's a massive message that I really want you to take away from this, that part of the simple is by giving yourself a good foundation in starting with a chord progression, 
see, look at our chord progression, our first four bars, which is this. That little bit here has been extrapolated into all of this. Just a few basic kind of rules, basically doing the same thing and expanding it. You'll see everywhere I expand, I'm using the same formula over and over. Not in a rigid way, but just to say, okay, how can I extrapolate this? As in, make it grow, add extra poles to my fence line. And I've been really super open about how it's come and what's happened. At the moment, this is not mixed. I'm still up in the air in my own mind as to whether I make another video just showing this mixed, or whether I even make another video with me doing a mix of this and then showing me swapping out these sounds for something different to see if I can move this piece, because it's just notes, see if I can move that into a different feel. Maybe I can use some of the sounds from my more sort of rockabilly goth type pieces, put them in here and see if it turns out in that vibe, in which case I will prove to you that genre counts for virtually nothing because you can take a song, as we've seen plenty of times before, and we can re-image it in a different genre. In other words, the genre is, it's like this shirt. I swap my shirt, I don't become a different person. I'm just a guy wearing a different shirt. Any questions? Ask them down below. If you want to hire me to do something to help you deliver your material, because remember, you don't have to do all this all yourself. There's a massive amount of understanding in here, which you trying to do yourself could well just be getting in your way, stopping you from delivering your song. You know, there's a reason that Bowie hired guitarists like Mick Ronson to help make things happen for him. If you want me to help you make things happen, talk to me. You have a good day now.